What a weekend. What a week. God is good. Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland, Evo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today as we stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And if you're in a neighborhood, I'd love to have you come on by. And if you go to this church, I'd love to have you come by and, and join us as we have a new group here uh, this morning of faces and people and just being blessed by their presence. So it's been a busy week. We just had uh, a lot going on this week. We had a men's meeting. We had discipleship class. We had church. Uh, we've, we had uh, other meetings going on. We had our, our dedication and our baptism to end on Sunday, and we're all just tired. But God is good. He uh, blessed us with a lot of blessings. Uh, so it was a wonderful time. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll get into the Word of God. Gracious Father, we come before you this morning, Lord, and we ask that your Holy Spirit, Lord, would minister to us as we begin a new week, a new day, Father, and we walk by faith and not by sight. I pray, Lord, that you remove our feelings and our emotions, Father, that we may not idolize them, but idolize your Word, Father, and what it has said to us, Father, and how we ought to live in this world, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you minister to us in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Patty. Good morning, Diane. Glad you could join us. We are in the book of Philippians, and we will be in chapter 3. As Paul seems to be closing up here, and he begins by saying in verse 1, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same thing to you is not tedious, but for you, it is safe. It is safe. Uh, a preacher's final words is always, finally, I'm coming to a close. But it doesn't necessarily mean he's coming to a close. Right? We're, we're about ready to be done. But then he takes another 15, 20 minutes. Right? This is Paul here, and he's rejoicing that he can repeat these things. Now, this is interesting because... Paul saying that repetition is important, right? Why is repetition important? Because we forget. We forget at the moment. We forget the truth. We put it out of our mind. We can't recall it for whatever reason. We, we don't. We, it's not that we forgot about it. It's just we can't recall it in a sense and in a place and time. And so Paul says it's good to repeat things. It's it's not something that's tedious. But sometimes we look at it as that, right? I don't know how many times I've gotten. Uh, complaints, again, murmurings and complaining. I'm just going to call it like it is. Murmurs and complaints from Christians who have gone to other churches and, and they'll say things like, I'm tired of hearing that evangelistic message from the pastor. Every Sunday, evangelistic. Every Sunday, evangelistic. You know what? He's an evangelist. Get used to it. <laughs> That's what God's called him to do. And either you support it or you get out of it and find a place where you can go. Or you stay and you support it. And, and it's the place that God's called you to. You have to know that. And so then you support it, and you go to other Bible studies, you go to the midweek service, and, and so forth. But don't sit there and complain because God has given him a gift to be an evangelist. Um, repetitive is a good thing. People are being saved. Uh, I've heard Christians tell me, I've experienced this myself, where, where um, there was a time when we used this, the, the gifts of the Spirit and there was so much confusion over the gifts of the Spirit at the time because so much was being taught on it. And there had to be clarification. And so I would clarify it every time we would have an afterglow here. And it seemed like every time we met, once a week, and we would do an afterglow, I would repeat myself. Okay, these are the gifts of the Spirit. This is how they function. This is the order. This is what we'll do. And finally, I guess after a few times, someone came up to me and says, you know, I'm tired of hearing that. And they just left the church. Because they felt like I was correcting them, you know, and, and telling them something that they didn't know. And the fact is, I was telling them something they knew, and they just needed to hear it again, that this is how God has set order. So Paul's saying, it's not tedious that we hear these things over and over. And I don't get tired of hearing them, the same message. You would think you would, if you keep hearing about the cross and Jesus dying on the cross, you know, but every Sunday we talk about that cross. 
and Jesus dying on the cross and being our example. And I don't get tired of it. It's good for us, as he said here. It's safe for us to remind us. Why? Because there's so many things out there that want to rip us off from the truth. And that's what he's getting into here. So he says in verse 2, beware of dogs. Now, that's a little tough, Paul. Obviously, you don't have tack or diplomacy here. I mean, right off the bat, you call people dogs. What kind of preacher are you? Beware of evil workers. Beware of uh, malutations or manipulations of the body parts, cuttings of yourselves and people that will mislead you in that way that somehow if you cut yourself, you'll be closer to God. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. So he gets right to the point that, that look, we need to be reminded of the truth because there are so many people who are telling us lies. They say that, in order to spot counterfeit money, like a $100 bill, if you've ever taken a $100 bill somewhere, they usually mark it with a marker now. And apparently this marker will tell you if it's a certain uh, type of paper. Or they have a machine that they put it under and it uh, has some sort of light and it'll tell you whether it's counterfeit. In the old days, they used to have you study the real $100 bill. You would get to know the $100 bill. You would take that $100 bill and you would study it you would look at it over and over and over and over, handle it over and over and over again, touch it, feel it, the thickness and the texture and, you know, all of that stuff. So that when someone gave you a, a fake $100 bill, you grab it and you go, wait a minute, something don't feel right. Something don't look right. And you'd be able to tell that that was not a real $100 bill. How? By repeatedly knowing the true $100 bill. That's how. And so that's why we need to hear the word continually because there's dogs out there. Paul calls them dogs. We would probably say false teachers today or men who would want to mislead you. You know, we would try to be a little nicer than Paul. But Paul says dogs and we're to beware of those, um, those groups. And let me just list them off without giving you a whole lot of details. You have to be careful of those that are always teaching about prosperity that God wants you rich. You have to be careful about those who put any kind of law on you from the Old Testament. For instance, Seven Day Adventists. If you were to worship, on, you have to worship on Saturday. When they say you have to worship according to the law, be careful because they're bringing the Old Testament law to the New Testament times and you can't do that. Be careful when they say they're Christians, but they don't believe that Jesus is God in the flesh, but he's Michael the Archangel's Jehovah Witness. Be careful when they say you can become a God as a man, like the Mormons believe. Be careful of those people. Be careful of, of the United Pentecostal group that says you have to speak in tongues in order to be saved. Be careful of those things. Uh, these are evil men out there who, who are confusing people, and so you have to know the word of God. As he goes on, Verse four, though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Now, Paul's going to talk a little bit about himself here and not in the sense that he's lifting himself up, but in the sense giving his credentials. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, there's nothing wrong with saying God has taken me from this place and put me here. This is what he has done. This is uh, how he is using me. Um, you can do that with humility, understanding that it's only by the grace of God and nothing that we have done. So Paul says, here's my credentials. He says, I was circumcised the eighth day, which means he was a good Jewish boy, of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. So we know he came from the tribe of Benjamin there, who was a son of Joseph, a Hebrew of Israel, or a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee. So I am, if you want to look at 100% Hebrew, I'm 100% Hebrew. And if you want to look at the law, I'm a Pharisee of the law. I kept the law. The law was important to me. And so he's giving us his credentials here, <coughs> his <coughs> uh, confidence in the Lord. Now concerning zeal, I persecuted the church. Concerning the righteousness, which is in the law, I was blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. So he's, in a sense, sharing here that these things that I boasted about in the past, these things of who I am, are really nothing compared to what I am now in Christ Jesus. Uh, I count them as loss, a waste of time, uh, a hill of beans, in a sense. Uh, but indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, 
Jesus, my Lord, of whom I suffer the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. So Christ is the most important thing over anything that we do in our lives. Any knowledge that you have is rubbish compared to Christ. I would rather have a man that knows Christ and is, is a humble servant of Christ than a man who knows everything there needs to know about the Bible and is arrogant. I don't care if he knows everything in the Bible. I don't care if he's a great speaker. If he doesn't have the love and compassion of Christ, it's nothing. You know, it, I, I find that that people want to serve God, especially in the capacity of a pastor or a role of a teacher. Now, whether they come out and say it or not, but they have that desire. But I find that they struggle with the simplicity of Christ. Well, they have all this knowledge. They speak very well. They're very educated, but you can't get them to serve for anything. For them to go out and pick up pieces of paper, oh no, that's beneath me. That's not what God has called me to do. And I would rather have a man that's picking up a piece of paper that can hardly speak could get up and share the gospel. Because he's speaking from humility and not from his uh, education or from pride. Um, and there are those that, that will sit there and they'll critique everything that you say because they are experts in the English language or experts in, in the law of God or experts in the Bible. But the reality is if you can't love one another, you're not an expert in anything because that's really the ultimate commandment is to love God and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And if you can't love others, if you can't serve others, if you can't wash the feet of others, then God hasn't called you to be a pastor or a teacher because you've got to be a servant and one that serves and loves and takes care of God's children. He goes on in verse 9, Be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, that righteousness which is from God by faith. So our faith in Christ gives us the righteousness of Jesus Christ in us. That I may know him, verse 10, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of of his suffering, being conformed to his death. Now, what a prayer request. I want to know you, God. What, what are we really saying when we say that? I want to know you, Lord. And then add to that, I want to know the power of the resurrection. That means, that means the, the, the way of living a new life in power, <clears throat> that you can live that new life in power and not just live in weakness, but in the power of the resurrection, that new person in Jesus Christ in that power, but also not just the power of the resurrection, but also the fellowship of his sufferings. Now, how many of us want to know that? I want to know what it's like to suffer like Christ. What it felt like to put thorns on his head, to be uh, beaten, mocked, and ridiculed, his back whipped. Those are the sufferings of Christ that we probably will never, never understand or know. But Paul says this is what it is to have a relationship with God conforming to his death, if by any means I may obtain or attain to the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already obtained or am already perfected, but I press on, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. So we press on. We endure the trials and the struggles. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forwards to those things which are ahead. I press forward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> what is Paul saying here? He's saying that there are men that are suffering and they're backsliding. They're not going forward. <clears throat> They begin to be attacked by the enemy because they're doing a great work. And that the attack is so great that they question God and his purposes in their lives. And Paul says they've fallen away. Now what does backsliding mean? Backsliding is just stepping back. It just means stepping back. It means not going forward. That's all it means. So if you're not going forward in your walk, I'm not talking about Maintaining your walk. I'm talking about going forward in your walk. Because you can maintain your walk, and that's backsliding. You're not going anywhere. 
You're just standing in the same place. But backwards is where you stop, you stop, uh, stop doing certain things. Well, <clears throat> I'm going through so much and I just can't pray. Oh, now you're backsliding in prayer. I just can't read because when I read, I just don't hear him. I'm backsliding in reading. In devotions, I'm not going to devotions anymore. You know, I'm backsliding in devotions for whatever reason. Now, I'm talking about a person that's going through trials and then taking steps back. I'm not talking about a person that's dealing with these issues and trying to go forward. But backsliding, Chuck always says you can't go forward if you're walking backwards. You know, Paul's talking about a person that persevering. He's forgetting those things that are behind him, the sufferings and all those things, leaving them in the hands of God and going, I'm going forward. I'm just going to press forward. And that word press is the word that we get under pressure, extreme pressure. And I'm pressing forward. I used to love running. And the best part of running for me was running in the wind. When we get our, you know, 50 mile, 60 mile an hour winds around here, uh, I would run around Sky Country area, and I'd love running against the wind. The wind would be pushing on me, and I would be pushing on it. And I felt like it would give me more strength because I'd have to work harder to fight against it. That's what Paul's talking about, fighting against the pressure, pursuing and persevering through the sufferings that you're going through. And this is what a Christian does. It says, therefore, let us, verse 15, as many as are mature have this mind, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already obtained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. Now, what is he talking about? He's talking about what he just said back there, how we ought to be pressing forward to the goals, to the prize that God has set before us. Brother, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Now here he doesn't, uh, doesn't name them, but he says there are many who are walking contrary, who have denied him, who have left him, who have divided him, uh, persecuted him. These are the dogs and the evil workers that he was talking about earlier. And these men walk contrary to the truth. And he says... Mark them out. Mark them out. Now he doesn't say, he doesn't say, broadcast their name over the pulpit, you know, and that's something that I had to learn, because it hurts when someone does some things to you, and you have this tendency to broadcast their name over the pulpit. But it says to mark them out. Don't trust them. Don't entrust them with the things of God, because they are probably not faithful men. He goes on in verse 19, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. These are men who want fame, glory, honor. These are men who want the status to be up in the front. They're earthly men and, the, earthly men and they set their minds on earthly things. And then Paul ends here in verse 20, 21, for our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies. And Paul is saying, look, Christ is doing something great. He's going to transform these lowly bodies, these feeble bodies, one day through his power, the power of the resurrection, and you're going to have a new body in Christ Jesus. God is going to work all these things out for his glory. We have to keep our minds on those things. Amen? Look, you might be new to the ministry, you might be old to the ministry, but eventually you're going to find out that you have enemies. <clears throat> your greatest enemy, I believe, is yourself. Because you'll be battling within your own mind, the Lord. You'll be putting up walls and taking the offense with God. You'll do things like, why are you doing this to me, God? Why are you allowing this to happen? Why don't you help me, God? These are the things that we battle with God on. That is our major battle is ourselves. And we need to change that mindset to, Lord, thank you that we're going through this and somehow you're going to work this out for good. You're going to bring a greater work through me 
because of it. You're going to refine my character. You're going to build my faith. You're going to do all these wonderful things. So we have to battle that mind thing. We have to give that to the Lord, even our minds being given over to the Lord. Uh, the second greatest enemy is the, en is the enemy himself, Satan, who kind of orchestrates everything else around us. He will orchestrate a little bit to a certain degree our battle within our minds with God, just like with Peter when Jesus said, get thee behind me, Peter, because you're thinking like Satan, you know. Uh, but Satan is in control of a lot of other things, and he comes in and he attacks us. He attacks us in many different ways. Uh, I believe the second greatest battle is our own family, our own family and how uh, they attack us, and they can become... Uh, enemies of us too. And we see that throughout the Bible. We mentioned it earlier. Uh, God created Adam and Eve. And who was the first enemy of Adam? It was Eve, <laughs> who, was, who was married to Adam. Relatives, right? And you just continue to read on and you see a lot of struggles within families. And that's why Christ said that you have to be willing to let go of family. You have to be willing to have father, mother, brother, sister. So they're going to be against you at times, and you have to let them go. Uh, the greater work is more important than, than even our relationships with one another in our blood relationships. And then outside of family is those that serve with us. You know, you have Judas Iscariot you know, that Jesus had to deal with. So those are our enemies around us. And then on top of that, you have the world, right? On top of that, and, and it's a lot. But we have to put our faith in Jesus Christ ultimately in the end. We have to give those things over to the Lord because we can't battle them in the flesh. We don't have the strength to do so. We can pray about them and leave them up to the Lord. Let God deal with them and let God deal with you and just be faithful with what he's given to you. There, there's enough there just in that being faithful yes, to your work and what God is doing through you. Uh, being faithful to love your neighbors, to love your brothers and sisters in Christ that are here to fellowship, be a part of the church, not isolating yourselves and so forth. Because that's another enemy is isolation. I'm just going like, to isolate myself. I won't go to things. I'm just going to do my own little thing. You can't do that. It's not going to work. You're going to fail. And it's going to fall apart if you do that because we need one another in prayer. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for your word. And wow, Lord, the Apostle Paul, through experience, Father, of suffering, pain, he really does nail it right on the head, Father. He does give us some great, great application here, Father. What we need to do, Lord, forget those things that are behind us, Lord. Things we can't change, things we can't control. Just, just give them to the Lord and just get busy with what he has given to us and trusted to us, Lord. We pray for strength and power, Lord, for the anointing of your Holy Spirit that we may endure today's trials and struggles, Lord. May we put you first and foremost in our lives. May we love one another, Father, just as you commanded us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. Hopefully we'll see you this coming Wednesday at 9 a.m. Have a wonderful day.